Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, thank you very much for this really thoughtful and generous introduction. And before I begin, I really want to um, thank everyone here, really, not just the staff uh, at the RCC, but also all of the fellows and the students who I've really had uh, the very great privilege to have the opportunity to exchange ideas with while I've been here, um, and who were very patient with me at the beginning when I arrived and really um, didn't quite know what was going on. <laughs> so I've, I wanted to come to the RCC really to learn from you, and I wanted to come to the, the RCC to, because there really is a big shift taking place in my field, medical anthropology and the medical humanities, from global health, which has been the paradigm that I've kind of organized a lot of my previous research around, um, towards planetary health. And planetary health approaches try to understand the interdependencies between human and natural systems, and to see human health as a possibility dependent on people's involvement in the environments that they live in. And I really thought, you know, where better to think about these questions than at the RCC, where you have this huge expertise in thinking about the environment in very complex and interesting ways, uh, much of which has been new to me, and it's been a really wonderful experience. So what does a medical anthropologist have to say about environment and society? I ask myself, I continue to ask myself this question, when I began working on the emergence of non-communicable diseases in the West African city of Dakar. These diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, respiratory diseases, are often called in Dakar new diseases. Now there's a very lack of firm data um, about, a, a real lack of kind of, uh, of, of information about these diseases that makes it very difficult to speak about their origins, their history, their scale and their impact with any real um, uh, certainty. Um, however, I think that we can say that these new diseases are probably not new. Uh, but their novelty lies in their new visibility. They're becoming more and more visible in the city and they're beginning to have a very serious effect on people's health. So predominantly older people, um, but increasingly middle-aged people are suffering from the symptoms that are associated with these new diseases. More and more people are talking about these diseases and more and more people are asking themselves where they come from. So today I'm going to use, kind of continue to use the term new diseases in order to stay as, as close as possible to my informants categories. And I want to stress at the outset that the question of where these diseases come from and how they emerge is very open. Because I think that it's this very openness of these questions that makes them a powerful and important conduit for new forms of environmental consciousness and environmental thinking. So in the global north, we are obviously uh, pretty familiar with these diseases. So we tend to think about them as diseases of excess, as manifestations of overconsumption, or as a consequence of our intrinsically sedentary, problematic, unhealthy lifestyles. Understanding how new diseases affect people living in the global south means rethinking some of these assumptions. So in the case of Dakar, for example, we need to understand how these diseases coexist and entwine with the persistent hunger, which is a consequence of the great precarity and instability in the city's households, uh, particularly in the suburbs, which is where I'm carrying out my research. So the households that I'm working in are large households of up to 20 people, and these households may be dependent on just one or two salaries, or on a very complex pattern of, remitt of remittances and fluctuating and uncertain incomes. So I think it's very important to remember that when I talk today about eating as patterned, structured, or shaped by desires and preferences, if there is a rupture or an interruption in the household income, this can really collapse overnight and people can very quickly um, be exposed to hunger. Hunger is very uh, close all of the time to these households. So as a medical anthropologist, uh, I began this research um, uh, by collecting body stories. So I began by asking people questions about how their, uh, their body experiences and how they felt that their bodies were maybe changing. So these body stories were narratives about symptoms and sensations, and I was trying to understand where and how new diseases began to manifest on the body. So new diseases bring new symptoms to the fore. Dizziness, constricting headaches, and shortness of breath are often referred to in the households that I work in as cube diseases after the Magi stock cube, ubiquitous in West African cooking and increasingly critiqued as poisonous. Prolonged experience of these symptoms can bring about malaise, or malaise, a kind of lethargy often considered a precursor to death or to a sudden health crisis. Malaise itself often overlaps with cholno, a kind of existential exhaustion associated with the burdens that women shoulder in keeping the household running. Tension and pressure, 
words that designate abnormality inside the body, were so suggestive, so close to people's ordinary vocabularies for describing their everyday, daily experience, that they became an important way to express pain and impairment, um, uh, social impairment. Of course, people did not just monitor their own bodies. They also drew attention to the effects of pollution on their children, who returned from journeys to and from school lethargic, or who had suffered from symptoms like a persistent cough. So already in that very brief sketch, we can see that these connections are being made to stress, to grief, overwork, and exhaustion. There are also stories about physical sensations associated with exposure to the urban environment, the crushing and the tightening that comes from exposure to pollutants, and the struggle to catch one's breath. More than anything else, however, people talked about what they called bad eating. And it was really food and its dangers that were at the heart of the stories that people told about new diseases. Before we consider bad eating, I think it's good practice to take a moment to think about what consider people consider to be good eating in Dakar. So in Dakar, good eating is collective. Food is shared among a large intergenerational household of around 20 people. Um, it's pleasurable. The midday meal is a moment of, uh, of sensuous pleasure it's the midday meal is a moment of sensuous pleasure in an urban environment that does not provide or sustain many such pleasurable experiences. And finally, good eating is rooted in the reproduction of a tight repertoire of dishes, a very small selection of dishes that people um, know, are very familiar with how to cook and how to eat and that they reproduce um, every day. And these dishes are very are highly adapted to the urban palate. At the top of these dishes, at the apex of the urban cuisine, utterly synonymous with good and pleasurable urban eating is a dish called chebujen, fish with rice, a high salt, high fat, highly flavorful dish. And chebujen has been the source of much negative commentary and attention in terms of its impact on health for many years. Post-colonial public health authorities have critiqued the taste of the urban proletariat for imported white rice, which is at the base of, of chebujen, in terms of a dependence, a cultural tyranny, and, and, and an addiction. As new diseases become more visible in Dakar, people are confronted by a set of everyday dilemmas. How can they nourish their families in a city still deeply affected by hunger, while at the same time responding to the nutritional and health needs of people living with diabetes and hypertension? And importantly, crucially, I think, how can they achieve this balancing act while at the same time meeting these cultural expectations of good eating? If, as I've uh, argued already, good eating is a crucial source of everyday togetherness, meaning, and identity. If single households increasingly contain people with different nutritional needs, can people continue to eat together? Responding to and managing these new norms of eating at the same time as feeding everyone in the household, which is already, I stress, a significant achievement, a significant expenditure of energy, it's this work, this balancing, that I'm calling the work of nourishment. And of course, it's not only people in Dakar who ask these questions, and it's not only people in Dakar, by any means, who are called upon to perform this work of discerning consumption. Around the world, people are experiencing inhibitions and concerns about food. And these responses are coming more and more to construct our identities, mediate our relationships with those closest to us, and to saturate the everyday with novel forms of attention and anxiety. And these questions are, of course, not just of interest to consumers, um, who might seek to protect themselves and their, and their family's health, but they're also of great interest to public health authorities and to practitioners of planetary health. So we know, for example, it's a, it's a very great uh, source of anxiety, I suppose, for public health um, workers, that it is very difficult to change how people eat, because food is at the heart of social reproduction, ritual life, economic life, and kinship. On the other hand, from a reading of food history and a lot of the wonderful um, histories that are available to us, uh, histories of food and diet, we know also that our diets do change, sometimes very dramatically, sometimes very quickly. And we also know that the market has historically been very, very good at re-engineering our palate and our preferences. So just as Sydney Mintz showed us that there is nothing natural or intrinsic about the English love for sugar, he shows us historically how the English learned to appreciate and to value sugar. Perhaps, I think a lot of people who are working in 
in the field of planetary health or thinking about sustainable forms of eating and consumption are really interested in this question. Is it time that we learn how to gain sensuous enjoyment um, uh, from the consumption of more sustainable and, and healthier foods? And this is the goal of a, of, um, a project at the Humboldt Museum in, uh, University rather, in Berlin, which has been really useful for me in thinking about the Anthropocene kitchen as a site of translation, transition, and potentially as a site of new practices of resilience and sustainability. I want to take you now briefly into the world of cooking and everyday nourishment, and I want to do it through, a, through close attention to a social sensation, taste. The taste of food connects us to the specificities of Senegalese cooking and to the way it reproduces key social values. For something that might perhaps be considered ephemeral or individual, I think colloquially that's often how we talk about taste, Everyday talk about taste in Dakar is full of claims about the relationship between the past and the present and full of critique about the, the form that that present takes. In the past decade, a form of urban home cooking has emerged called saf cooking. Saf cooking is a very savory, pungent, highly salted and flavored form of cooking. And it's often used to compensate when there's less money in the household and so smaller portions of protein in the dishes. Saf cooking is also associated very closely in particular with urban cooking because it disguises the musty and unpleasant flavor of imported vegetables that have traveled a long way to the city's markets. A tactic adapted for scarcity, saf cooking is endorsed for its pleasure. Women use stock cubes, oil, mustard, vinegar, salt, sugar, dried fish, lime, and fresh parsley, actually among many other ingredients, to produce a punchy dish and the first spoonful or handful hits the back of the throat and floods the mouth with saliva, eliciting the exclamation, saf, it's delicious. Saf just means delicious. The taste is affectionately associated with the brash femininity and sexuality of the urban women cooking the sauce. Knowing how to bring the flavor is expected of young women leaving their own houses to live with and cook for their husband's extended families. Many people, however, claim to remember and to value a plainer, a more muted, and a more subtle palate. And many women I spoke to claim to favor this style of cooking in the present, arguing that eating saf was forced on them by their extended families, and that their own true desires were for plain and simple food. Saf cooking, then, is highly controversial, and it's intimately related to the dilemmas of good and bad eating that I sketched out at the beginning of this presentation. It brings to the fore some of the compromises, often really difficult compromises, that are involved in communal eating, and it triggers bitter arguments um, in, in households about personal taste, autonomy, rapid social change, and styles of nourishment. Self cooking is a way of living with scarcity, and a way of using what is available in the city, improvising with the, with the kinds of um, uh, materials that are available in the city, to extract pleasure from an urban environment that frequently assaults the senses. People are, however, very worried about the health risks of eating surf. People increasingly express concern, for example, that these strategies, these tricks, as people often call them, of how to really bring the flavor of how to produce a dish that is very intensely flavored, break the, intergen the intergenerational transmission of culinary norms, because women increasingly learn these tricks from their peers young experimental home cooks, rather than from their mothers and their grandmothers, who might have um, cooked using a repertoire of more traditional ingredients. These experiments in modern home cooking are also explicitly blamed for new diseases. Um, so high blood pressure in particular, very, very serious um, health issue in Dakar, is often blamed on mixing proteins in new ways, on mixing meat and seafood in kind of improvised ways, in what people describe as an almost relentless pursuit of the most, the most powerfully flavored, the most deeply and, and excitingly, exotically flavored dish that you can produce. Okay, so taste is mobilized as a form of critique, often critiquing the values of the present uh, in comparison with the values of the past. And it's also used as a kind of critical tool to negotiate the urban environment, a kind of um, heuristic for knowing the everyday. I was given the prompt uh, today to talk to you um, a little bit specifically about ethnographic methods and what uh, ethnographic and, and anthropological approaches can do 
and how they can help us to understand forms of living in the Anthropocene. So in a sense, in this talk, I've been slightly provocative, deliberately provocative, in that I've really held you at the level of the household and kind of forced you to stay there with me. Um, there are many things that I haven't spoken about directly that, of course, uh, very dramatically shape the availability and the palatability of food and therefore the emergence of new diseases. I haven't spoken about colonial history. I haven't spoken about commodity chains. I haven't spoken about contemporary agroecological practices in the Sahel or small-scale farming in peri-urban Dakar, or at least not directly have I spoken about these things. Um, so I've really kind of followed the, uh, the, the anthropological um, method of staying very, following, staying very close to the grain of what people's own explanations are for the emergence of these new diseases. And I think that the role, of what the, the role that medical anthropologists might play in planetary health, and planetary health involves, let's say, two adjustments in scale. It involves working on a kind of, on a global level to really understand, um, for example, the way that uh, deep um, uh, changes in the climate have affected human health. It also involves, I think, also kind of expands the, uh, the historical scale at which p uh, anthropologists might be, um, might have to work at. And I think that is a challenge for our kind of, our, our very presentist um, orientation of ethnography. Elizabeth Roberts, for example, suggests that um, in this context, looking at the incorporation and the relation of bodies and environments, we need to practice a, what she calls a form of bioethnography. So anthropologists, she says, should be working with biological sampling, really working at the very edge of ethnographic explanation in multidisciplinary teams to detect and to diagnose, to really uncover the origins and the manifestations of new diseases. So today, to be a little provocative, I've taken a slightly different approach. And rather than seeking the origins of new diseases, I've instead examined the cultural forms and claims that emerge alongside those new diseases, asking how new diseases change eating. And what I hope that I've conveyed to you today, along with some of the, uh, the complexity and the force um, of how, uh, how um, complex and conflicted these social worlds of eating are, um, I hope that I've conveyed that these forms of eating, these modern forms of exposure, um, as, they make thing, as they make people ill and as they change bodies, it's not just new elements getting under the skin, it's not just the bodies that are changing, but there are, uh, I think, at least qualitatively new forms of environmental consciousness and new, uh, hopefully new forms of resilience that are emerging alongside these new diseases. Thank you.